So congratulations for having made it this far and welcome to the final of today's lecture videos. I want to talk about what to do about prejudice. And the first aspect is actually very closely related to my PhD research is the importance of intergroup contact. So Gordon Allport in the 50s suggested that the best way to improve intergroup relations is to bring people in contact with each other. And he suggested that that's most likely to have positive results if the groups have equal status, if they cooperate in the pursuit of a common goal, and if there is some authority support for that contact. So for example, if in a school setting, it's clear that teachers encourage different groups of students to meet. This might seem a bit trivial as an idea. By the time Allport suggested it, it was definitely contested in a setting where segregation was legal, where the whole idea was that the best way to manage race relations was to keep African Americans and white Americans apart from each other. Clearly, this was a strong hypothesis. But there are still suggestions today that the best way to manage conflicts is to keep people apart. But the evidence suggests that contact is almost always, promoting contact is almost always the better approach. There's a large meta-analysis that was conducted in 2006. And what you do for a meta-analysis is that you collect all papers that have been published on a certain topic. And then you run an analysis across all of these findings. And that allows us to be sure that we don't just have false positives, some exciting studies and overlook others, but that we really know what the whole body of literature says. And what Petty Crew and Trump found back then was that in almost all the studies they found, and they found about 550, almost all of them, there was the expected association. People who had more contact, had less prejudice. And importantly, this also was true for experimental studies, which allows us to be confident about the direction. So it's not only at least that less prejudiced people have more contact, but it really is that contact causes reductions in prejudice. And it does that even in suboptimal conditions. So even if the status of the groups is not equal, the conditions that Allport proposed certainly help, but even if they can't be achieved, contact is still valuable. Especially since then, there has been a lot of research into mediators, so into variables that explain the relationship between contact and prejudice reduction. And here, empathy and anxiety are two that have a lot of evidence behind them. So if you have more contact with members of a specific group, you're more likely to feel empathy for them. You're less likely to feel anxiety. And both of that then again predicts reduced prejudice. There's a clear risk in contact, the risk of subtyping, which you always come across in the stories about really racist or sexist people who have this one black friend or this one female leader they can accept. And certainly that exists, but the evidence suggests that it's actually relatively rare, that in most settings, the generalization from improved attitudes towards the person I have contact with to the whole crew, that in most situations that really happens. So apart from enabling contact, which in some settings is also, also an easy intervention to do, universities might consciously put a diverse group of people into the same student hall, for example. 
But apart from that, we might be interested in ways of promoting attitude change through conveying certain, certain kinds of messages. Might be in the media, might be in an organization, might be in the student union, if you get involved there. So what kind of messages might help to reduce the negative impacts of prejudice and stereotypes? One attempt would be to just tell people that colors or ethnicity or some other group-based identity shouldn't matter, shouldn't be seen, that stereotypes shouldn't feature in decisions and establish the moral standard of color blindness and stereotype suppression, which has been quite clearly shown to not work. We cannot shape our cognition that much that we don't see things and that certain things don't come to mind. But we can feel guilty about thinking and seeing things. But if we do that, contact becomes very unpleasant. And that unpleasantness leads to contact avoidance, but for example, also leads to discrimination in hiring. If seeing a person of a certain ethnicity leads to a situation where I feel tense about even perceiving that and where I feel I need to suppress my stereotypical thoughts, then it's quite natural to say, well, actually, I don't want to do this every day. So I have this negative emotional reaction to the prospect of working with that person. So it doesn't work. Group-based identities are here. They are part of human interaction. So they can't just be ignored. The alternative approach might be to explicitly celebrate multiculturalism. To have authorities, people who set norms in societies, organizations, promote multiculturalism. The problem with that is that when you talk about multiculturalism, most people hear that you just want to celebrate minority culture. So particularly in settings where you have groups that are in a situation where they are part of an ethnic majority, for example, but feel that their culture and their group are undervalued anyway, this can backfire. So for example, among white working class people, promoting multiculturalism can backfire. In this recent rather well-known study, um, Osborne and colleagues showed that promoting multiculturalism led to increased support for Donald Trump among at least some of their research participants. So that's also problematic. But what can work well is to highlight positive existing social norms. So in many settings, you will have a majority of people who don't discriminate, who appreciate diversity, and you might decide to highlight and communicate that. And this very recent intervention study by Mora and colleagues in US universities showed that that actually predicts attitude change and it predicts a greater feeling of inclusion on the part of students who were typically excluded. And this is related to the idea of extended intergroup contact, where it has been shown that just me knowing that some of my friends have contact with a group that I might initially dislike improves my attitudes, likely because of the same effect of highlighting a, cer a certain social norm of inclusion. So I think that's actually one of the most promising ways to promote attitude change and improve intergroup relations. And I'm, I'm happy to discuss that further if any of you have thoughts on this. But to wrap up, I know that I 
through many different theories and terms and concepts at you. So I want to briefly summarize the main points from each part of this lecture. So firstly, we're talking about sources of prejudice and stereotype. And the important sources to re remember here are the notion of realistic conflict. Sometimes groups are in competition, which might need to neg negative emotions, not always. Social identity, where we have a strong desire to be part of positively viewed and distinct groups, which might lead to us seeing other groups as more negative than our own. In terms of cognitive processes, the idea of illusory correlations really matters, where we might honestly, but still just mistakenly, believe that we observe a correlation that then feels like it justifies um, a stereotypical belief. And then um, we have some important things around social influence, group dynamics, and institutions, and the way we think about those in terms of just world beliefs that explain the emergence of prejudice and explain how it is sustained. We talked about how people generally maintain false beliefs, prejudicial beliefs and others. And the first important concept was cognitive dissonance and our desire to avoid it, our desire to avoid entertaining contradictory beliefs and our ability to employ motivated reasoning. So to make facts fit pre-existing beliefs. And of course, another way of maintaining false beliefs is through group dynamics. We'll discuss that further next week. We talked about the impact of prejudice. I want to highlight three important concepts here. Self-fulfilling prophecies, where stereotypes and prejudice shape people's behavior in a way that leads to them being confirmed. Stereotype threat and lift, which is related, but focuses on the performance of people who are stereotyped against and suggests that negative stereotypes might undermine performance. And then implicit bias, which is about learning associations that are widely present in our culture in a then subtly shape behavior. And in this video, I talked about ways of addressing prejudice where promoting intergroup contact and enabling intergroup contact is shown to be very powerful. And we're emphasizing positive intergroup norms can have really positive effects as well. So that's it for today. I'd encourage you to do the readings and then I'm looking forward to seeing you in class. Please make sure to have a look through your notes and bring any questions that you will have. So I'll see you in the live sessions.